we're here to talk to you tonight, but I also want to say that this is very much a two-way street because we learn a lot about the phenomena we study, whether it be neuroplasticity in musicians or mechanisms of tinnitus or technologies in listening with hearing aids. We learn an awful lot from the people who participate and come to events like this. So we want to thank you for that as well. Um, my job tonight is to talk a little bit about how hearing works. And I think I'm going to begin by saying that sound waves are generated by vibrating sources in the environment, uh, such as those produced by the musical instruments you just heard. Another familiar example are vibrations produced by vocal cords and speech, which you're hearing from me. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about how we hear and what happens when hearing loss occurs. So let's have a look at the organization of the ear. So the outer ear uh, sculpts sound waves entering the ear canal. You can see the ear canal there, impinging on the tympanic membrane. Um, sound waves are manipulated passively by our ear. Uh, this is why we sometimes cup our ears in order to hear better. But in other species, the outer ear is itself active. For example, our family dog perks up her ears whenever anyone says the word car. <laughs> Either way, the ear canal conveys sound waves to the eardrum, the tympanic membrane, which vibrates at the wave frequency. Now the middle ear transmits the vibrations of the eardrum to the inner ear via three small bones, which are popularly called the hammer, anvil, and stirrup. Uh, these are the smallest bones in the human body. And if these bones are damaged, we experience conductive hearing loss. The vibrations of the tympanic membrane are not conduct conducted to the inner ear. Otologists can actually repair or replace damaged bones surgically, which actually seems miraculous to me. Uh, the inner ear is the cochlea, which you can see um, the arrow pointing to it there. This is a snail-shaped structure, uh, hence its name. And it houses what's called the basilar membrane, which we've actually shown unwrapped at the bottom of the slide. Um, the auditory receptors, called hair cells, they're not shown on this slide, you'll see them in a minute. They're actually located in this membrane. And I have an animation that uh, shows you what happens on the basilar membrane when we hear a Bach fugue. And as you listen to this animation, notice that the high-pitched sounds activate the narrow part of the membrane to your left down there called the base, whereas the low pitch sounds activate the distal wider end of the membrane. In this way, the basilar membrane resolves the different sound frequencies or pitches that comprise the fugue. So let's, I hope this will work, it should. It is. So we're entering the ear canal now, going down to the tympanic membrane, you can see it. You'll glimpse the bones quickly as we go by them. And then we come to the cochlea. Now the cochlea is gonna unwind. It doesn't unwind in your head, it's unwinding here for purposes of illustration. So this is the basilar membrane, and watch what happens now when we hear the Bach fugue in D minor. really quite amazing, isn't it, that that's going on inside of your head when you listen to this view, or for that matter, when you listen to me or anybody else speak. Uh, I mentioned that the hair cells are embedded in the basilar membrane, so here is an actual microphotograph of the basilar membrane showing the hair cells. There are actually two types. There are outer hair cells, OHCs here. There are three rows of those in the basilar membrane, and then there's one row of inner hair cells shown at the top. You'll notice the little tufts coming out of the hair cells. Those are called stereocilia. This is why they're called hair cells. Um, now, the inner hair cells are the auditory receptors, the road that you see at the top. When activated, these receptors send signals into the brain. 
If an inner hair cell is lost owing to aging or noise exposure, we are deaf for the particular frequency that that hair cell responded to, although some of its neighbors may pick up some of the signal. Outer hair cells, on the other hand, work differently. They modulate the stiffness of the basilar membrane. And in this way, they can amplify the response to sound, and they can also sharpen the frequency specificity of the response of the membrane to sound. So if a bank of outer hair cells is lost or damaged, our ability to detect the sound will be reduced. The sound will have to be louder for us to hear it. So let's have a closer look at an inner hair cell, just one of these in the diagram. Because the inner hair cell are the inner hair cells are the auditory receptors, they are contacted by nerve fibers that send sound signals into the brain. Each hair cell in the human uh, cochlea is contacted by about 16 to 18 nerve fibers, although I'm only showing three of them in this drawing. The connection between the nerve fiber and the hair cell is called a synapse. An important property of auditory nerve fibers and their synapses is that some auditory nerve fibers, nerve fibers have very low thresholds for firing. The nerve fiber sends signals into the brain when the sounds are very soft at the threshold to detect it, of detection. These low threshold fibers tend to be located on what's called the pillar side of the inner hair cell to your right on the screen. Uh, other nerve fibers have much higher thresholds for firing. This is important for understanding the nature of hearing loss. These thresholds, these auditory nerve fibers, only fire when the sounds are well above the threshold of hearing, approximately in the range of quiet speech and above that. We need our high threshold auditory nerve fibers to hear speech clearly. It turns out that these high threshold fibers that we need for speech processing in particular are more easily damaged by noise exposure than are the low threshold fibers, which are pretty robust. Because these high threshold fibers are needed for speech processing, damage to them can reduce our ability to understand speech in noisy environments, even though our low threshold fibers may be intact. So um, I'm now going to turn, well, we are now going to demonstrate three auditory tasks for you that are designed to assess hearing. Each task is chosen to reflect a different pattern of damage to the ear. I want to stress that the conditions for testing here are not optimal. We're not really testing your hearing. Now, you need an audiologist to do that. But we just want to illustrate the methods. And the first method we're going to illustrate is the audiogram. So what we're going to do here is we're going to play three sounds, not all together, singly. The first sound is going to be a frequency of 500 hertz, which is about one octave above middle C on a piano. And you'll hear the sound, and then it will progressively get smaller. Sorry, it will progressively get louder. Let me try that again. It starts pretty loud, and it will progressively get quieter to some point where you won't be able to hear it. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to raise my hand when I can no longer hear that tone. So let's have the first test, Dan. I didn't raise my hand because I heard all of those tones. And many of you may have too, but maybe not all of you. The next frequency is going to be quite a bit higher. It's going to be 2,000 hertz, 2,000 cycles per second, or vibrations per second. We'll do the same thing, starting with a tone that's well above threshold, and then it will get quieter. And I will raise my hand when I can no longer hear that tone. So I couldn't get all of them. I don't know. I can't see you out there, so I don't know how many of you are like me. You couldn't hear all of them, but you could probably hear many of them. The next tone is an even higher frequency at 4 kilohertz, and this gets into the region of hearing loss. 2 kilohertz is in the region of hearing loss to a certain extent, too. 4 kilohertz is more so. 4 kilohertz is 4,000 hertz. So this is quite a high-pitched tone, and we'll do the same test. So let's listen. Well, okay, I didn't hear any of those sounds. 
So I hope, I hope more of you heard them, uh, because this means my threshold at 4 kilohertz is uh, not clinically normal. Um, so this is what the audiogram tests. It tests your ability to detect very low level sounds. And for, the, for you to have a normal audiogram, you need a lot of healthy outer hair cells and inner hair cells. So substantial damage to outer and inner hair cells will affect the audiogram. The next test we're going to demonstrate to you is recognizing speech and noise. And what we're going to do here is we're going to turn on some background sound as though you were in a restaurant. So you hear some background uh, conversation and noise. And then we're going to play short sentences uh, as we hear the background noise. Now the sentences, uh, they're going to be about 10 or 11 of them. They're all different uh, and they will get progressively softer. Dan, if you could just play the first one to give us an example. A boy ran down the path. Okay, that's, kind, that's the kind of sentence you're listening for. And so let's start and I'll raise my hand when I can no longer hear the sentences. Oh, by the way, if you have headphones on, you're not going to hear the noise. So you might want to take your headphones off for this test. A boy ran down the path. Flowers grow in the garden. Strawberry jam is sweet. The shop closes for lunch. The police talk to drive. She looked in her Okay, now I heard all of those, but that's a little unfair, because, not fair, because I happen to know what this is. <laughs> Plus, I did this test last night. And that's actually interesting. If you know what you're listening for, the top-down part of auditory processing comes into play, and that top-down part helps the brain interpret what's coming up from the ear. So, just out of curiosity, I can't see you out there, but how many people heard the sentence, the police helped the driver? A few of you did. How many heard the sentence, the match fell on the floor? I heard it, because I say I have an advantage. OK, so now you know what some of these sentences are. Well, one of them is the police helped the driver. Another one is the match fell on the floor. So let's do the test again and listen to the sentences. A boy ran down the path. Flowers grow in the garden. Strawberry jam is sweet. The shop closes for lunch. The police help the driver. She looked in her name. Okay. So how many people heard the police help the driver? Oh, almost everybody. But here's the more difficult one. How many heard the match fell on the floor? Quite a few people. How many heard he really scared his sister? Okay, that was the last one. Um, well, this is a demonstration of disambiguating or hearing speech in noisy environments. And for uh, us to be able to perform this task well, we need very good outer hair cells. And we need a lot of those synapses on high threshold auditory nerve fibers. So if you have damage to your outer hair cells and you have hidden synaptic losses on these inner hair cells, I call them hidden because they're high threshold. They won't affect the audiogram. If you have this kind of hearing damage, this test is going to be particularly difficult. The last test I'm going to demonstrate is not one that's used in the auditory clinic, um, or aud an audiology clinic routinely, but we use it in our laboratory because this test gives us a snapshot of what those high threshold auditory nerve fibers are doing. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna play three tones. They're gonna be pure tones. The middle tone is going to be amplitude modulated. That is, it's going to flutter. And you should listen to see whether or not you can detect that the middle tone is fluttering and the other two tones are not, that they're different. And with we will play the three tones. You'll hear the flutter very plainly because we're going to flutter it a lot the first time. But then with each repetition, it's going to get 
uh, smaller and smaller. The amplitude modulations will get shallower and shallower. And you need your high threshold auditory nerve fibers to be able to hear these very small amplitude modulations. So let's do the first run, Dan. fluttering very well. Uh, we're getting a little pop at the start of the tone. I'm not sure why that's the case, but that's not really part of the test. So let's just do it one more time and see if you can see how far down uh, this list of tones you can go. idea of the test. One reason for using these amplitude modulated tones is we can measure the brain response uh, to those tones using uh, electrophysiology, uh, electrodes on the scalp. And the brain response to those tones uh, depends upon healthy, high threshold auditory nerve fibers. So if a person has this kind of damage in the cochlea and it's hidden from the audiogram, it may show up in this test. So those are some examples of the kinds of tests that we can do to sort out patterns of damage in the ear. Um, there are other tests besides these, but this is enough to give you an idea of, of the approach. Now another attribute of hearing that many people with hearing loss experience is abnormal loudness perception, or called hyperacusis. And we're illustrating that in this slide. So in normal hearing, our perception of the loudness of a sound grows gradually as the physical intensity of that sound increases. This is shown here uh, with the open squares, which describe a normal loudness growth function. And you'll notice that when the sounds are very, very soft, 10 decibels, well, it's inaudible here. As the sound intensity gets larger, our perception of loudness increases so that up at 90 dB, this sound is described as very loud. Not too loud, we could actually go higher than this, but you get an idea of how loudness perception grows gradually as sound intensity increases. This is a normal loudness growth function. But if you have hearing loss, this function changes. And that's shown here in the dark squares. The first thing you may notice is that you don't hear the sound until it's presented about 45 dB in this particular example. That's due to the hearing loss. But then as physical sound intensity grows, your perception of loudness grows very quickly. And in fact, it exceeds the normal loudness growth curve. Um, so that this level of sound, which a person with normal hearing would say is OK, you say, this is very loud to me. So this is hyperacusis. And there are different ways of measuring it, but um, I, won't, I won't go into those. Um, what I want to say about loudness perceptions. Um, I want to talk a little bit about how this phenomenon of hyperacusis comes about. Now, one mechanism may be that when you have damage to your outer hair cells, excitation spreads on the basilar membrane as the sound gets louder. And as the excitation spreads on the basilar membrane, more auditory nerve fibers are recruited or activated, and that makes the sound seem louder. So outer hair cell damage can lead to hyperacusis. Um, another mechanism that we've only come to realize in the last 10 or 15 years, 15 years or so, is called increased central gain. This is a pretty interesting phenomenon. And what happens here is that when a neuron in the brain loses its input from the ear, its sensitivity scales up um, so that it's able to respond more strongly to the inputs it still receives. This scaling up of central gain is good for detecting weak sounds if you have some hearing loss. But the price to be paid may be hyperacusis. Modern hearing aids try to reduce hyperacusis by compressing uh, the high frequency, oh sorry, the high intensity sounds. Uh, basically scaling them down so they don't cover quite the same dynamic range that they would if you did not have the hearing aid. Um, now, 
Hyperacusis is also frequently associated not only with hearing loss, but also with tinnitus. And I'm sure many people in the room have the experience of tinnitus. I have tinnitus. Now, people with tinnitus experience a continuous ringing or hissing of the ears that can be annoying and in some cases very disturbing. Most tinnitus sufferers have a mild to moderate hearing loss detected by their audiograms, which may cause both the tinnitus, the hearing loss, and uh, the hyperacusis. But about 15% of tinnitus sufferers have audiometrically normal hearing. Uh, and the question is, well, if they have audiometrically normal hearing, why do they have tinnitus? Why do they have hyperacusis? And the answer to this uh, appears to be that these individuals have damage to those high threshold auditory nerve fibers, which is not detected uh, by the audiogram. And because it's not detected by the audiogram, it's often called hidden hearing loss. If hidden hearing loss is present in these individuals, you might expect tinnitus sufferers with a normal audiogram to experience some hyperacusis as the deafferented or affected neurons scale up their sensitivity. Well, there is some evidence that this is the case. Um, in a recent study carried out in Sao Paulo, Brazil, almost 29% of 170 adolescents in a private school had a psycho psychoacoustically verified persisting tinnitus measured in the sound booth. That's a pretty high percentage. Um, now, risky listening habits were almost universal in this sample of adolescents. They went to parties several times a week. They, had, uh, they wore earbuds and listened to music uh, all the time. Um, and despite the fact they had a lot of exposure to environmental sound, their audiograms were completely normal. However, when we measured their sound level tolerance, their sound level tolerance was reduced by 11 decibels compared to the adolescents who didn't have tinnitus. Uh, that's a lot. Um, in other words, they're experiencing some hyperacusis. Uh, now, we also tested these adolescents a year later. A subset of, of them volunteered to come back. And of the returning tinnitus, sorry, of the returning adolescents who had tinnitus in the first test, 42% still had their tinnitus a year later, and their sound level tolerance was still reduced, in this case, by 17 decibels. Um, on the other hand, tinnitus resolved in the remaining 58% of the adolescents, 59% approximately, um, and when their tinnitus resolved, their sound level tolerance returned to normal as well. So you might ask, what's going on here? Why do some teens recover from their tinnitus and hyperacusis and other teens don't? Well, one possibility is that the teens who recovered changed their risky listening habits. And there's a little bit of evidence for that in this data, but it's not very strong evidence. That might be a possibility, though. Um, but there's another reason that may be at work here, too. And that is that um, if we look at animal data, we find that damaged synapses and auditory nerve fibers can recover uh, after damage in guinea pigs, but they, they don't recover in mice. So it might be that the noise exposed teens who recovered from their tinnitus were more like guinea pigs than mice. <laughs> we also know that inner and outer hair cells can be damaged structurally by loud noise. <clears throat> Uh, and yet the audiogram won't be affected because there's a sufficient number of remaining healthy cells that the audiogram doesn't change. This structural damage might still be enough to induce tinnitus and reduce sound level tolerance, but this kind of damage can repair over time. And finally, there's a very different possibility, which is that central factors might be resolved, might be responsible for the relationship between tinnitus and sound level tolerance. Maybe the ear doesn't have anything to do with it, although I personally think the ear has a lot to do with it. But it might be that the teens uh, reported reduced sound level tolerance because they're afraid of sound when they have tinnitus. Or they might be under some kind of academic or other kinds of stress. So we can't say which of these mechanisms are operating here, but still the, the high prevalence of tinnitus and hyperacusis in teens is certainly a cause for concern. Now, I've not said much about the brain, which receives sound information from the ear. That's the job of the ears, to resolve 
the content of a sound and convey that information to structures in the central nervous system. The brain is actually where auditory perception occurs. And if you look at the projection of auditory pathways in the brain, not only do they, do they project to auditory cortex, and that's shown in the green uh, area on, in the brain that you see on, on this slide, but that information also is conveyed to brain regions that are involved in consciousness, that are involved in memory, or memory for musical sounds and speech sounds. Uh, their, their information is conveyed to great regions of the brain that are involved in movement. Uh, there's a very strong coupling between auditory and uh, information and movement. You may notice that our musicians tend to sway when they play. Uh, I find it very difficult to sit still sometimes during symphonic concerts. Um, the field of auditory cognitive near, oh, and I forgot to mention emotional processing, which is really very important. Information coming up from the ear distributes to areas in the brain, a structure in particular called the amygdala, which is very important for encoding and generating emotional experience. So the field of auditory cognitive neuroscience aims to understand how this brain network activity uh, supports perception and, and behavior. Now researchers in the live lab investigate these questions, as well as questions relating to hearing loss, its consequences, and how it can be managed or treated. But the good news is that even when some hearing loss is present, as in my case and many people here in the audience, even when we have some hyperacusis, uh, I have some hyperacusis if I'm in a symphony orchestra concert, a mezzo forte sound is okay, but if it's a forte sound to a normal ear, I may hear that as double forte or even triple forte, even though we have some hearing loss and some hyperacusis. The sounds that we hear are still sufficient to stir our auditory memories and to stir our emotions as if our ears were somewhat younger. So this is a global picture of how auditory processing works uh, going from the ear to the brain. 